and welcome to Game Sack. Now, we're doing the RPG episode. It's been requested many, many times. No, Joe, it's been requested many, 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 many times. <laughs> You're probably right there. Anyway, we've got some cool RPG series mm -hmm. to talk about, and, well, yeah. as always, why don't you kick it off yeah. for us? With the best stuff that I've got. Here okay. it comes. Okay. Earthbound is the game that every Super Nintendo collector covets. Let's take a look and see if it's really as good as the price it commands. So the story is about an alien, Gygus, that wants to destroy all mankind, but little does he know that four kids plan to stop him. All along the way, your characters must find and collect sounds from eight areas known as your sanctuary. Only after you've done this can you face Gygus. There's lots of interesting towns and areas and you'll meet many types of people and fight many, many different types of enemies. It's all very simple and the battles are really fun. The battle screen doesn't show any of your characters. All you see are the enemies and your command menus. Some people might want to see their characters fight, but I actually think this is pretty cool. For the most part, the game is fairly balanced, but not always. For example, there are times when you're just being pummeled by the enemies and it feels like you have no control. Then, you try that same battle again and you win with barely any effort at all. And I fight the same way, it's not like I used a different magic or something. The weapons range from baseball bats, slingshots, and even frying pans, anything a kid under 10 would have. Also, three of the four characters have psychic abilities which is basically your magic system. These can deal out a lot of damage or even protect your characters. To use magic, you use PP points, and for most of the game I was having a lot of trouble keeping the PP points around. They just seem to diminish really quick. You can replenish them by eating certain foods, but that brings up probably the biggest complaint about this game, the inventory system. It's not broken by any means, but you're going to struggle quite a bit because your characters just can't hold very much. I found myself constantly wondering what items I should drop or sell or if I'm even going to need them in the future. Your weapons and equipable items are all kept in your inventory, so that's four less spots available for food or other items. If your inventory is full and you want to buy a new weapon, you'll first need to drop, sell, store, or give another character the old weapon. I just wish they would have thought this part through a little better. The music here is enjoyable, but it's really strange. But it fits the craziness of the game environment, and I like that. The graphics are, well, average. The towns and environments are all colorful, but they definitely feel very flat. The enemies don't have a lot of detail, but they're drawn well enough to have some personality. And speaking of personality, this game has tons of it. There's a lot of enjoyable dialogue that I found pretty amusing. Now, throughout the game, your adventure will pause for no reason so a photographer can take a picture of you. You know, it's kind of funny at first, but it happens way too much and gets annoying after a while. I hate fuzzy pickles. If you want to save the game, you need to make a phone call to your dad. He's never home and must be away on a business trip. Yeah, right. He's definitely out cheating on mom. If you just turn the power off without talking to your dad on the phone, you'll lose all your data. Anyways, Earthbound is an enjoyable game that's quite different from any other RPG out there. It's got enough charm to keep you wanting to play all the way through to the end. Only a few times did I ever feel boredom setting in as I was doing a little bit of grinding. But to be honest, I find it hard to believe the prices people are willing to pay for a copy of this game. I still think it's worth the original $60 or so, but I definitely pass at paying more than that. Earthbound is actually the second game in the series. In Japan, it's called Mother. The original game was released for the Famicom in 1989 and was never translated and released in English for the NES. As you can see, it looks very similar to Earthbound in pretty much every way. Supposedly, this here is an English prototype translated by Nintendo themselves. It has the same quirky humor and all of that stuff, but it's only vaguely related to the other games. Speaking of which, Mother 3 came out on the Game Boy Advance, and once again they decided to leave it in Japan. Ass wipes. Lunar, the silver star on the Sega CD, was originally programmed by Game Arts and brought over to the US by Working Designs. It brings you cute little super deformed characters and a very well developed game. 
It all moves at a very brisk pace, and the battles take place with kind of a side three quarters overhead view where you can see all of your cute little SD characters. Honestly, it's kind of hard to take the battle seriously when everything looks so gosh darn cute, but it really doesn't detract from the fun. Like I said, Lunar is a pretty good game. The story is decently done, and as you'd expect from a CD game, the characters are voiced, but there is very little animation in the cutscenes. You take control of Alex, and he's on a quest to become a Dragon Master and, of course, save the entire universe, or at least the solar system. The graphics range from mediocre to fairly good. Overall, they're generally just too dark and muddy looking, but there's some decently drawn stuff here and there. The CD music is also fairly decent, but really it's not amazing. Overall, it's still a very worthy RPG to play, and if you have a Sega CD, I definitely recommend you play through it. You've come to fight for the soul of your dear Luna, but you're too late. That was followed up by Lunar 2 Eternal Blue, also on the Sega CD. You know, I really like this one a lot more than the first Lunar, for the most part. Firstly, the animation in the cutscenes is about 200 times better, and they're much more enjoyable to watch. Secondly, the graphics are more detailed and much brighter. In fact, everything in this game just looks really nice. The main character, Hero, is also far more interesting than Alex was in the first game, and as a whole, this game seems better all around. But there are a few drawbacks. The first are the battles. While overall I think they work better than Lunar 1, they just seem so much slower. There are also way too many random battles in this game, and it really makes it drag in places. There's also sort of a pay to save feature in the US version, which some people complained about, but you know, I never really found it to be an issue. Why Working Designs added this is beyond me, but as long as you're not saving every two minutes, you should be fine. And the music, while definitely better than the first game in my opinion, is unfortunately presented in glorious mono at a very low fidelity. Still, I highly, highly recommend this game, even if it does have some dated humor in the Working Designs translation. It really is a lot of fun, and you do get attached to some of the characters. I was actually surprised at how much I enjoyed this, and it's quite addictive to play. This is the best RPG on the Sega CD, that's for sure. Hero! Both Lunar and its sequel were later ported to the Saturn and the PlayStation with various upgrades and changes. This here is the Saturn version of Lunar 1, which takes advantage of the special MPEG video card. The graphics are clearly much improved as you can see here. They did change the story around and also the music for whatever reasons I do not know. Personally, I like the original music better. I never bothered with the English translations because although I do like the Lunar series, I don't like it that much to play bastardized versions of the games. However, if you've never played the Sega CD versions, these are probably pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, so there's some good games. I think Earthbound should, you know, make a lot of people happy. That's one of the more coveted Super Nintendo games out there. It is. It really is. And I just, you know, kind of like you said, I don't understand why people pay so much for it. It's worth yes. $60, like you said. But yeah. Jeez, I don't know. But that much, you know, I mean, well, it's up to you. Yeah, well, now let's hand it back over to you again with another game that's just insanely popular. Yes. Chrono Trigger for the Super Nintendo is one of the most beloved RPGs of all time. We don't really like talking about super popular games like this. Inevitably, somebody will get bent out of shape that we didn't like it in the same exact way that they did, but really, we can't leave this game out. And it's really good. Basically, your friend accidentally sends you back in time. <laughs> That's a big accident. After running around for a bit and restoring the proper way of things, you find out that something else is messing with time and will take over everything at some point. So, you all band together to change the past and set things right. You can go to a bunch of different times and it's fun to see the same place 400 years earlier or even 1000 years into the future. 
you be jumping back and forth all over the place in your quest. The battles here aren't random, as you can see the creatures running around, but the majority of the battles are definitely forced. Only some enemies can you actually avoid. The battle system is pretty good, but for some reason there is a time bar that you've got to wait for before you can select your actions. Personally, I don't really understand what this adds to the game, but whatever, it's not really a hindrance. Overall, the game is pretty well balanced except for some of the bosses. They're a bit overpowerful and you'll definitely need to grind before you take them on. The game has 13 endings if you can believe that. No thanks, I'm not going to play through this game 13 times. There's just way too many other games to play. The graphics are pretty good. No real complaints here except sometimes when you're in battle, the shadows will disappear when you use a technique and then reappear after you're done. It looks kind of sloppy and really, they should have just taken the shadows away from the entire battle to avoid this. The music is really good as well with some nice tunes here and there. I've personally played through this game twice and it definitely holds up. It's fun saving the entire world with these characters. But they must have done a pretty bad job of fixing things up, because 20 years later it all falls apart again in Chrono Cross for the PlayStation. This game features a whole new cast of characters, up to 44 of them in fact. For me, that's just too many. That's great for a fighting game, but not an RPG which relies on character development as a motivator. Anyway, the main character is Serge, or Sergei, but let's just say you probably won't stick with him until the end. Personally, I don't think this game lives up to Chrono Trigger at all. The battles are a bit convoluted. Gone is the time bar, and instead you get percentages which affect the strength of your attacks. Each character is assigned a color as well. Red and blues damage each other pretty severely, for example. The battles can take an enormous amount of time due to all of the flashiness and it gets kind of boring once you're on your 500th battle. Thank god you can run away at almost any time which is really nice. One thing about this game that is definitely better than Chrono Trigger is the music. While that game had a great soundtrack, Chrono Cross blows it away. Overall it's a decent game but not a great one. I never bothered to finish it. I've played about 24 hours so far and I'm still on disc 1. Look at disc 2 here. It's never even been out of the jewel case and it never will. Fantasy Star on the Sega Master System was the first RPG I ever played through. Going in, I had absolutely no idea what to expect of this game. In fact, when I was at the store, I had a choice between this and Thunderblade. I actually stood there for a bit trying to decide between them. Fortunately, I chose the more expensive game and I still have it to this day. Anyway, on to the game itself. What you have here is a very modern RPG for an 8-bit console. It was far more advanced than anything available at the time. This was due in part to the unbelievable 4, four mega, mega power, power contained within the game. You go around and you fight battles to gain experience pretty much just like you'd expect. Battles are done in the first person perspective. You see your weapon slashes and the such, but you never actually see your characters fight. Your goal is to kill Lassic, who failed your brother before the game began, and while you're at it, you might as well save the entire Algol star system. Algol consists of three different planets, Palma, your home world, Motavia, the desert world, and Dezorus, the ice world. You'll even be joined by a few different characters who will stick with you for the entire game. The story isn't bad. It won't win any awards for the character development and it isn't tremendously deep, but it's plenty fine for the game and it gets the job done. But there are a lot of typos in the English translation. Yeah. The music is well done with some memorable tunes that pick up right where they left off after a battle instead of restarting from the beginning over and over. I always thought that was kind of cool. The 
The graphics are absolutely amazing for this system. The battle scenes are all very detailed and each monster is animated and some even have multiple attacks. All of the overhead worlds are very pleasing to the eye as well. Then there are the dungeons. You never saw anything like this on the NES, that's for sure. The Master System is pulling all of this off without cheating, there are no special chips in the cartridge, and it still made NES games look very primitive in comparison. Still though, these dungeons can be very confusing to navigate, so it really helps if you make a map. I hope you have a lot of grid paper. The battle system works very well, and you usually aren't overwhelmed by random encounters. You can save the game absolutely anywhere except in battle, and I love this. Speaking of saving the game, I purchased this game in 1988 and the battery still works fine. In fact, I used it to play through this entire game for this episode and some of my old saves were still there. I played through the whole game and no problems encountered. Sega said the battery was supposed to last around 5 years, but instead it's lasted nearly 25 years. Well, what can I say? This game was an amazing experience for me overall, and it's definitely one of the best RPGs I've ever played, and probably one of the best I ever will play. Fantasy Star 2 was released early in the Genesis's life, and it had a mind-boggling 6, six mega, mega power. power. This game takes place 1,000 years after the original Fantasy Star. You start out on Motavia, which seems a lot more green than it did 1,000 years ago. It's no longer a desert planet, that's for sure. Your mission is to fix the Mother Brain, which pretty much controls everything, and it's gone haywire. Not good. The gameplay is pretty nice, and you encounter even more characters here, which you can switch out from time to time. The dungeons are now presented at an overhead perspective, and they can get pretty long and involved, so be sure to bring lots of healing stuff. This game is also the first time I ever saw a main character in an RPG killed off. Final Fantasy VII may think it's all that, but Fantasy Star II did it way sooner. There are only two planets you can visit this time, as sadly, you don't get to go to Palma. Fortunately, you can now teleport between towns, which is very, very convenient. And this time, you actually get to see your characters fight in battle. This is pretty cool, but unfortunately the battles suffer because they all take place on the same boring blue grid, even the final boss fight. Personally, I'd rather see cool backgrounds than my characters fight it out, but there are some people out there who'd rather see the characters. Other than that, the graphics are pretty good. The music is also great with many classic tunes. The game itself, however, is pretty tough. You'll need to grind a lot for experience and money here, and the random battle encounter rate is much higher than the original game. Also, you have to put your name in every single time you save the game. What the hell? Still, it's a great game and a decent follow-up, but I prefer the first game. Fantasy Star 3 came out on the Genesis not long after Part 2, and it seemingly has nothing to do with Fantasy Star at all. This time you're about to marry some chick and then a demon comes and kidnaps her. This game is a huge departure for the series, and it doesn't have the same science fiction type feel that the other Fantasy Star games do. It's definitely the black sheep of the family, but really, it's not all bad. It does actually tie into the other games, believe it or not. In fact, it takes place about a thousand years after Fantasy Star 2. What sets this game apart is that it has branching paths. You decide who you're going to marry and then suddenly you're in the future controlling a different character with a slightly different story than if you had chosen to marry someone else. The overworld graphics are pretty nice and the battles have been changed back to being more like those of the original game. You don't actually see your characters fight, but instead see their weapon slashes and such. Plus, the backgrounds are back. The monsters generally look pretty silly, and they have very little animation. Honestly, there's not much impressive going on here, but the battles do work very well and they don't waste your time at all. They're very quick. That's definitely how battles should be, and it makes grinding so much less of a chore. Still, you'd expect more from a game that has a planet-crushing 8, eight mega, mega power. power. The music has its moments, but overall, it's pretty average. 
That's because they got a new guy to do the sound this time, but don't worry, he'll get another chance. Overall, I think this game is worth playing through, but I don't really feel much of a need to replay it, even with the branching paths. Play it only if you want to play all of the Fantasy Stars. Fantasy Star 4 on the Genesis definitely got back to the series' roots. When this was originally released, I didn't buy it right away for two reasons. First of all, it cost $100. Yep, that's right. Secondly, it came in a wimpy-ass cardboard box like a silly Nintendo game. $100 for a cardboard boxed game? I just couldn't understand why Sega suddenly hated me. But, oh man, I really should have bought it then and there. I think I would have enjoyed it even more if I had played it back then for the first time than I do now, and I enjoy it a hell of a lot now. Once again, you start off on Motavia and you have to investigate some monster appearances. Things escalate quickly and suddenly you're saving the entire Algol system again. The story is pretty good this time around with some good character development. The graphics are amazing, and they should be because this game has a universe melting 24, 24 mega, mega power! power. Oh, you're getting tired of me doing that? Okay. The battles now have backgrounds and you can see your characters fight it out. They retain the speed of Fantasy Star 3's and you can program and select macros. And that is awesome. Monsters from all three previous games also come back to try to stop you from saving everything. This game has some great fan service as well with lots of references to previous games and even some classic music. Yeah, the music is great in this game. The Fantasy Star 3 music guy returned and I think he may have brought a friend to help him because it sounds awesome. The game even has a lot of side quests to keep you busy. Now you don't have to do these, but really you should because it'll give you more time to spend with this awesome game. As a whole, it's definitely a better game than Fantasy Star 1, and it really would be tough to make a better RPG than this, in my opinion. It just delivers on so many levels, and even though I have it now, I really regret not buying it back on its original release date. Bravo, Sega, and thank you for making this game. Now, of course, the Fantasy Star games would end up on a few different compilation sets throughout the years. This here is Fantasy Star Collection on the Saturn. What's probably most notable about this one is that you can play the original game with the FM audio that was present in the Japanese version of the game that we never got to hear over here in the US. Of course, everything is in Japanese, so good luck. Fantasy Star was also remade from the ground up for the PlayStation 2 in a game called Fantasy Star Generation 1. This was a budget title, but everything has been completely reworked. This one here has gotten an English fan translation, and that's pretty damn cool. However, the developers did take some liberties with the game and even added some new enemies. And unfortunately, you can no longer save it any time you want. And Fantasy Star Generation 2 is, of course, a remade Fantasy Star 2, also for the PS2. They never got around to redoing Fantasy Star 3 or 4, but I think they planned on it. This one was a bit more faithful to the original game, I think, but unfortunately it doesn't have any English fan translations that I know of. Now these games certainly don't replace the originals, but they're a lot of fun to mess around with, especially if you're already a fan like me. And that's the end of part one of our RPG special. You know, we know we didn't capture every yes. single game available like you guys wanted, mm. but, you know, we do have some more great games coming down the line. We're going to do a few other episodes first, and we'll be yeah. back with RPG part yeah. two. Because we're playing the ones that we're going to talk about in the next episode as we speak. Yep. Yeah, so, and hopefully this episode was well worth the wait. Yeah, I think it was. Me I mean, too. Been yeah. making it forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway... <laughs> Uh, thank you for watching GameSec.
Joe, I'm a little worried, man, about this episode. I can already see the comments. I mean, stuff like, what about Cosmic Fantasy 2? What about Miracle Warriors? You didn't cover that one. How come you didn't cover Baker Prince? How come my favorite game ever, Treasure? You didn't talk about that one. And what about Albert Odyssey? Joe, you didn't cover any of these games. I mean, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I'm going to let you worry about those comments while I go empty my colon. Oh!